In this question down here, we're asked for which of the following hydrogenation reactions shown here will the energy per double bond be the most negative? The correct answer to this is B. And if you'd like to know why, I'll explain it right now. In this question, we're given a series of hydrogenation reactions. That is, uh, reactions in which we take double bonds and expose them to hydrogen and a catalyst. Hydrogenation reactions. Those, of course, convert the double bond into a single bond, as indicated here. We're then asked for which of these reactions is the amount of energy that you're going to get out the most negative. Now, the problem with this question is that it's worded in a really convoluted and ridiculous way, much like the way lawyers talk or write. What does it actually mean? Well, in terms of the most negative amount of energy, what we're ta actually talking about is this. If you've got an energy diagram, that is, you've got your reactant at some energy level, and then you've got your product down here at some other energy level, you'll of course have to traverse some kind of cute little energy hill here, but here's what happens. I've got a reactant, I expose it to a reaction, and it undergoes that reaction and eventually converts into product. Usually, almost all reactions have some amount of energy that has to go into the reaction to get it to start. That's going up this hill. That's called the energy of activation. If my product is at a lower energy level than my reactant, however, once I get over that hill, I will now get back all of the energy that I invested plus all of the uh, rest of the energy down here. In other words, all of this energy, the difference in, uh, in the energy levels between the reactant and the product, is the amount of energy that I get out. The lower this uh, product energy level is compared to the reactant energy level, in other words, the, the bigger the difference, the more negative the amount of energy is that I get back. Hopefully that makes sense. So the bigger the difference between these two shelves, the more energy I get back, the more negative the amount of energy is. In other words, the negativeness is the payout. That is the amount that I get back for my initial energy investment. How in the world do I sort through these and determine which of the, those is going to give me the largest amount of energy back for my investment? The answer is determined by looking at the reactants and deciding which one of them is the most unstable. Let me explain. The more unstable a reactant, the higher up it's going to be on an energy diagram. Now please remember, on an energy diagram, the more stable something is, the further and further down it is, the lower an energy is. The more unstable, the more reactive something is, the higher and higher and higher and higher up. So if I can figure out which of these guys is the least stable, he is going to be the guy whose energy shelf is going to be very, very, very high, which means I'm going to come down a larger distance when I hydrogenate him. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So let's go ahead and rifle through these. Which of these is the most stable, which is the least? This first one right here, benzene, is very, very, very stable. The reason is because it's aromatic. Now if you don't remember that, I'll post a link right here that will take you to a video in which I talk about the principles of aromaticity. Breaking apart these double bonds by adding hydrogens to them is very, very difficult to do and takes a ton of energy because you're breaking something very, very stable, an aromatic ring, uh, apart in order to convert it to a cyclohexane ring. Hence, because this is so stable, the starting energy point for benzene is going to be much, much lower. So this is probably going to be the reaction that will give us back the least amount of energy, especially in terms of how much uh, it costs to get it to go. So now we look at these two guys. I've got a cyclopentene and a cyclopentadiene. Which of those is the most stable and which is the least? Well, you might remember me talking in another lecture, and if you don't, I'll post a link here to it, about the fact that dienes that are conjugated, that is where I've got a double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, something like this, tend to be generally very stable and very nice. We might, we might therefore think that this is going to be very, very stable compared to the one up here. However, we have to keep in mind one thing. When you have a ring and you throw in double bonds, double bonds are much less flexible than single bonds, which means that the ideal bond angles that those carbon atoms want to achieve are much less easy to attain when you've got a double bond because it kind of locks it into place and makes it less uh, able to flex and move. So throwing in two double bonds into a ring actually does make that a little bit less apt to be able to move and attain the ideal, the ideal 120 degree bond angles around 
these atoms that it wants to attain, as well as the idea 109.5 around that sp3 hybridized carbon that it wants to attain. This type of phenomenon is known as ring strain. What that means is that this molecule here is experiencing much more ring strain than the molecule up here and is hence more stable. He is starting at a much higher energy level than molecule A. Furthermore, when I hydrogenate him, I relieve that ring strain by, by converting two double bonds into single bonds. Relieving that ring strain also gives me back a lot more energy. Hence, the difference between the product and the reactant is going to be much, much larger for option B than it is for option A. So option B is the correct answer. In this question, we're asked which of the compounds shown over here are structural, or in other words, constitutional isomers. The correct answer is D, none of the above. If you'd like to know why, I'll show you right now. This question gives us a bunch of crazy looking molecules and asks us to identify which pair of these molecules is constitutional isomers. Now I have to explain what that means. Constitutional isomers are two different molecules or more that have the exact same structural formula but are bonded together in different ways. For example, I could have the molecule C6H12. That is a formula for this molecule, cyclohexane. But you'll also notice that it is a formula for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, for this molecule, which is a type of cyclohexene. Sorry, both of these molecules have the exact same formula, C6H12, but they have completely different bonding patterns. You'll notice that this molecule has a CH2 stuck to 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 CH2 all in a ring, while this molecule has a CH3 stuck to CH2, stuck to CH, double bonded to CH, stuck to CH2, stuck to CH3. Completely different bonding patterns. Those are constitutional isomers. Let's see if that pattern fits over here. I've got a molecule that has a ring with a nitrogen here, bonded to a carbon, stuck to another carbon that's got this carboxylic gas group coming off of, that has this ring thing over here. And you'll notice as we look over here that all of the other molecules have the exact same bonding pattern. They aren't constitutional isomers. Yeah, the only difference between all of them is the three-dimensional direction in which these bonds are pointing. The dashed bonds, of course, indicate that they're pointing three-dimensionally away from us. The wedged bonds indicate they're pointing three-dimensionally towards us. So none of these guys are constitutional isomers, and therefore, the correct answer is D. Well, they're obviously not the same molecules as each other because they all have different collections of wedgies and dashies at the strategic positions called stereocenters. So what kinds of isomers are they? Well, indeed, they are stereoisomers of each other. And those are isomers in which the bonding pattern, the formula, are, is all identical. It's just that at certain centers, they're three-dimensionally shaped differently. In this bottom question, we're asked which of the following can exist as geometric isomers. The correct answer is D, none of the above. If you'd like to know why, well, stay tuned. I'll explain it right now. This question gives us a few different molecules and asks us to identify which of them can exist as a geometric isomer or set of geometric isomers. To answer this question, we have to understand what geometric isomers are. Geometric isomers is a phrase that is kind of archaic and you know, therefore not used that much anymore. But it means it's the same thing as meaning cis-trans isomers. What in the world is a cis-trans isomer? Cis-trans isomers can basically fall into two categories. One of them is if I have a ring and I've got some substituent coming up and the other one going down like that, uh, this would be trans because they're pointing in opposite directions. If I have the same kind of ring and both of them are pointing up, for example, these guys would be cis. This is a cis isomer. Are these two guys constitutional isomers of each other? Absolutely not. Constitutional isomers, you remember, are two molecules that have the same formula, but completely different bonding patterns. So I've got a CH2 stuck to CH2 stuck to CH2 stuck to CH, stuck to CH3 stuck to CH stuck to CH3, and over here I have the exact same thing. The only thing, or the only difference between the two is the direction three-dimensionally in which these substituents are pointing. One is trans and one is cis. We could call this a set of geometric isomers. Another type of geometric isomer or, or of cis-trans isomer is this molecule right here versus this molecule right here. Uh, if I can draw a double bond correctly. You'll notice that I've got a CH3 stuck to CH stuck to CH stuck to CH3. 
and the molecule to the left, and the molecule to the right has a CH3 stuck to a CH stuck to a CH stuck to a CH3. They have the exact same bonding pattern, same exact formula. They are not constitutional isomers. One is cis, the guy on the left, of course, is a cis around a double bond, and the other guy is trans. These are slightly different cis-trans isomers than the kind we have on rings, but nevertheless, we still can call them cis-trans isomers or geometric isomers. Hopefully, that makes sense. So, can any of these molecules shown here be geometric isomers or exist as geometric isomers. Once again, we can see that geometric isomers have to exist in, in one of two categories. One is either a ring or one is a, a double bond. Let's look at these molecules. Does this guy have a ring? No, it doesn't. There, uh, does it have a double bond? No, it doesn't. Can it exist as a set of cis-trans isomers or geometric isomers? Absolutely not. These are all single bonds, which means that all these bonds rotate freely in all directions, 360 degrees. I mean, you know, they're all kind of rotating around. The, these bromines are not locked in any position pointing uh, away or towards each other in any permanent sense, hence they can't exist as cis-trans. This is an alkyne. Can I have cis-trans around an alkyne? Absolutely not, because it's completely linear. It's not as, this, as if this CH3 is pointing up and this one's pointing down. It's totally a straight line, which means that it's not a cis-trans isomer, not a geometric isomer. How about this molecule? Well, there's nothing to be cis or trans to. There's not another bromine somewhere, and there's no double bond, and there's no ring. So the answer is none of the above. What in the world is a geometric isomer, really? Well, geometric isomer, once again, is an archaic phrase. We don't really hear that often anymore, at least I don't, but it still appears on standardized exams sometimes. It is a subcategory of stereoisomers. Stereoisomers generally exist as either enantiomers, which are non-superimposable mirror image molecules, or diastereomers. Diastereomers can be a little bit more complicated than that. If you need a review on stereoisomers, I'll go ahead and post a link right here, taking you straight to a video where I talk about them. Thanks, and have an enjoyable rest of your day.